straight from, uh, straight from the horse's mouth, if, if you will. And so I'm very pleased to bring up on stage uh, one of Docker's customers. This is a customer who runs one of the largest financial networks, has been working with Docker on this journey for two years, and has had really interesting learnings and great results. Um, a fantastic person to speak to who's running critical applications in a very diverse environment. Uh, please join me in welcoming Swami Kosher Lakota from Visa to the stage. <laughs> Ben, how are you? Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Good luck. Can we go one, ba one slide back, please? All right. Good morning. Hope you are all having a good time. My name is Swami. First of all, I want to thank all of you who are Visa's customers. Thank you for your business. You are in good hands. Thank you. Let me get the safe harbor slide out. This is a disclaimer that basically says that do your own research. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about uh, Visa's uh, strategy, the journey, and the progress that we are making, but more importantly, the lessons that we have learned. But let's talk about Visa first. Uh, we are one of the largest payment service providers. When we talk about um, being the largest, there are two ways to look at it. One, the reach of Visa, and the scale of Visa. When it comes to the reach of Visa, this is as global as you can get. 176 currencies, 3.1 billion cards issued. And when we think about scale, we process about 130 billion transactions and about $5.8 trillion worth of payment volume every year. So what's our strategy? Number one, we want to make electronic payments reachable to everyone and everywhere. That's very important to us, because the more you digitize your currency, the more, the world, the more safe the world will be. So the countries that are digitizing and the economies that are digitizing their currencies are going to be more safer, and the world will be a better place. And the second goal that we have is we know we're not going to be able to do that all on our own. We are opening up our technology and our platform through APIs. If you're a developer, you can do a Visa developer uh, search on your favorite search engine, and you will see how we are opening up our platform. And the third thing is um, Solomon talked about yesterday. Developer is at the center of what we do. The challenge that I have for the team is when a new employee starts on Visa, on the same day, that developer should be able to deploy code into production. And from an infrastructure perspective, we want to be able to have like just-in-time infrastructure, you know, self-service. And we want to be able to do all of that with the highest amount of security and availability. You know, when I talk to my peers and, uh, and the development partners, I tell them, you know, I like the developers. I want to enable you, provide self-service, but I don't want to talk to you. And they turn back and tell me, Swami, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, uh, what this talk is about. The, ben already mentioned about speed. To me, it's about speed and, like what Ben said, efficiency. And hopefully, by the end of this presentation, we will measure how we are doing against both of them. Let's roll the clock backwards for a couple of years. And this may be a story that you are, uh, you can resonate well with you as well. A few years ago, whether your workload is small or medium or large, we only have one solution. Virtualize it, put it on bare metal, we'll deal with it. To me, that's like taking a bare metal and then doing space division multiplexing. Right? As much you can slice as possible, depending on your virtual to physical ratios, you know, 40 up to 90. Now, when you look at the life cycle of that infrastructure after that is deployed, 
when it comes to provisioning time, you know, it may be anywhere from months to days. And it takes a lot of time to do patching. It's very painful. And from a tech refresh, it's very, very intrusive. And then overall, uh, from a multi-tenancy perspective in the virtual environment, there's a lot of uh, spacious customers. You know, there's a lot of uh, you know, underutilization. Now, since that time, on a little side note, we have been investing a lot in automation. In infrastructure today, we have a lot more developers than ever in the organization. And I think that trend is continuing to change, not only at Visa, but across the board when I talk to my peers. Now, going back to a couple of years ago, while we are deploying virtualization, what's happening is um, the infrastructure footprint is growing. And the business is growing global. And as a result of business being global, your change windows are shrinking. You cannot make any change. And then headcounts are not going at the same rate at which the infrastructure is growing. So what's the, what's the solution? Uh, before I go to solution, let me talk about efficiency for a second. When I look at efficiency, there are two ways I look at it. One, the efficiency at the provisioning time, which is the one time, like the instant gratification that people want by getting their infrastructure quickly, is if you look at any one year, it takes three months from the equipment that's get arrived at the loading dock to the time you make that infrastructure available for business use. And at the same time, when you decided to decommission an infrastructure and take all the software off, and unplugging it and putting it into the loading dock, it could be anywhere from one to three months. And in some cases, it could be even longer than that. And in, as a result of it, your installs and deinstalls are like 50% waste. And then if you look at the runtime efficiency, after the instant in, uh, equipment is deployed, and this is a research that we got from a company called Cloud Physics that you should check out, they have gathered from 30 plus companies on how efficient the virtual infrastructure is. And the statistics show that uh, nearly 90% of the infrastructure is less than 15% utilized. I'm sure you can do over-provisioning under the hood, but even if you do over-provisioning, it still is 45% max. And most of the stuff that's running on the virtual infrastructure is agents anyway. On top of it, there is no business value for the tech refresh. There is no business value for patching and maintenance. We would rather be giving business functionality than patching and, and maintaining. So we want to break this pattern with uh, a technology. And among all the technologies, we picked uh, Docker and microservices. When we looked at it, the perceived opportunity was, number one, developer productivity. And the second thing, which was very important to me, was how, could, how can we simplify the way we compose and deploy and manage the environment? There were a lot of choices that I had. You know, I could do platform by platform, do it for Java, do it for .NET, do it for MongoDB. But we found that if I go with a container technology with microservices, we can do a standard and even a generic way to do it across the board, across all the workloads, and more importantly, third-party packages. Most enterprises have a lot of third-party packages. I don't want to wait for the third-party vendor to make their technology platform as a service. And the third one is uh, time division multiplexing. We talked about space division multiplexing earlier. Now I can do time division multiplexing as well. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then overall, it felt like it's simple to manage. So we, we kind of jumped with our uh, feet right in. And we picked uh, two key services. One of them was an authorization platform, and another one is a risk decision system. And then we had to go through some key architectural decisions. The first one is, am I going to go with bare metal or virtual? And this was like a civil war among architects. And we finally went with uh, you know, bare metal solution. And the second decision that we had to make, there are a lot of options in the ecosystem. Which technologies do we use when it comes to you know, uh, you know, discovery, load balancing, and so on and so forth? And the third one is we're making a lot of progress on network and software-defined network at Visa. We were like deciding, should we wait for that to happen? Should we go with this? And we said that if we, if we are going to wait, 
we'll be waiting forever. We said we'll go with uh, what we have, with uh, you know, Docker bridge networking at that time. And then more importantly, security. We got um, you know, all the uh, you know, approvals required and, and validations from a security perspective. Now, after deploying this, we now have uh, this, these two services in production for over uh, six months. Uh, we are putting our cache traffic towards that one. And then about 100,000 transactions and the ability to go from uh, you know, 100 containers to 800 containers and the clusters are deployed in multiple data centers in multiple regions. And you can actually go to one of those sessions this afternoon where we'll kind of give you details about some of the network decisions uh, that we had to do. And if you look at um, after this is done, from a developer perspective, the provisioning time is in seconds, not like the days with the virtual environment that we had. And then secondly, from a patching and maintenance, there's no need to patch. We can actually hang the hats. I like that image. And if you want to patch it, just redeploy the application. And uh, the infrastructure is invisible. Our customers don't have to know any tech refresh. They don't need to know. And, and last and the most important, we have a lot of uh, cozy customers, uh, and we can do both time and space division multiplexing. Now let's talk about the lessons learned. The first one, which I'm sure probably a lot of people know, the granularity of the microservice is very important. Solomon talked about the image and the things that they're making to make the image size easy. And secondly, the memory footprint is very important. You could do microservices, but if your heap size is still big, you may not be using the best out of the microservices because memory, uh, most of the applications and the infrastructure is now memory bound. So you've got to manage your uh, memory uh, very well. And the third one is the load balancing. We wish we had more features in load balancing, but overall, we're kind of uh, happy with uh, what we have with uh, you know, some primitive load balancing that we have. And lastly, operation operationalization uh, is still work in uh, progress in terms of uh, hardening the platform and uh, hardening the processes uh, for supporting this environment. The good news is we have a blueprint on how to do this, and now we're expanding to five other application teams inside Visa. And one of them that I'm most excited about is the batch processing. So let's talk about the Visa roadmap. I'm a service provider for the developers inside Visa. So now I have like four options for our customers, uh, internal customers. One, you could do the classic way, which is you know, days for provisioning and a lot of uh, pre-provisioning and post-provisioning high-touch activities. Or, Mr. Developer, you can go with infrastructure as a service, which is self-service. We will get your image in a couple of hours. Or you can bring your own stack, and then we have a bunch of stacks that we already automated. <coughs> or you can bring your own service. And when you bring your own service, it will be container-first uh, architecture and implementation. And our view is that the more we move the workloads to the right, the better the efficiency is. In other words, the story is you can get a solution that will take days, or you can get a solution that can be done within seconds. So it's interesting that yesterday's Ben's analogy was kind of the 1980s uh, you know, gaming technologies that we all grew up with. When I talk about um, infrastructure and both space division and time division multiplexing, I use an analogy with my teams called as Tetris. And as the workload comes in, it's like Tetris. You want to have various uh, uh, you know, compute come in and go. And from a success perspective, speed, we can now measure in seconds. And from an efficiency perspective, I can actually correlate the containers with the actual business volume. With that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Wow, I love it. Tetris-like infrastructure. <laughs> Except I, 
Tetris all, always uh, eventually ended up uh, not working for me and caused me to waste time, but that's not the case with Docker. So, uh, Swami, thank you so much for, for sharing, uh, sharing uh, your learning, sharing uh, um, and sharing your wisdom about your journey. Um, as I mentioned, Docker has been able to have the privilege of working with a lot of customers and uh, learned lessons along the way. And while every customer has some unique aspects, we've sort of tried to boil it down into really three lessons in terms of, of how, to, how to think about deploying a Docker-based, a container-based environment that will scale, uh, and in, as uh, Swami was saying, help you move your workloads to the, uh, to the right. And there are really three lessons. 